Welcome to The Advocate, your Sunday reminder that important conversations are among the necessary tools for a SENA society. I will be talking about independence or still independence. Babasola Kuti will be talking about 2023 War or Peace. Oluwashegu Elegbede will be talking about 2023 general elections. Do not die in their war. Hussein Olariwaju will be talking about police and other security brutality must stop. We will be right back after this break. Independence or still independence. October 1st marked the Nigerian independence from Great Britain in 1960. A new constitution was established with a federal system and an elected prime minister and a ceremonial head of state. You know the story. Fast forward to this present day, we still ask ourselves, what have we done with our freedom? The country is increasingly marred with high level insecurity and not too progressive policies. Recently, the lapses in the educational system have pointed out this type of leaders we currently have on seats. Cultural intelligence with RED, in partnership with the University of Success, has released the 2022 Nigerian market sentiment on study motivations reports, saying 89.87% of young Nigerians express preferences for overseas university education. This cannot be further from our feed system. Notwithstanding this setback, there is hope that we can rise like the Finnish above the ashes. Our youths innovate mindsets, will to strive, and the determination to get it right come 2023 elections are evidences of light beyond the dark tunnel. If we could look beyond tribal and religious sentiment and vote in competence, then we would be a curve ahead of our current plight. Talking about the forthcoming 2023 general elections, let me ask my fellow advocates here on this pro program. Uh, what's your thoughts on the ongoing ASU strike, the response from the government and our educational system? So, uh, for me, I think the education system needs a complete overhaul of the system. And we also need uh, the government willingness to ensure that happen. Government must lead the train, right? However, we also have issues around the so-called lecturers. Because when you look at the system that is currently in disposition, just like you said, Nigerians seek oversee. Why? Because the system we have today is more predominantly uh, creating more teachers, more calm and poor, teaching the basis. It's not solving any peculiar problem. Just like you ask me, what have you done with the YDS that you've been doing? What have you done with the first law of motion? But it will amaze you to know that it is applicable to what we do in day-to-day -day activities. But because we lack the education system that enables us to solve problems, just like, let me give you an example. First law of motion says a system or a, a body will continue to be at rest unless it's enacted upon by a force. External force, yeah. By an external force. What it means is the status quo will remain the same. Okay. Unless there is a force, it's just a direct interpretation of the science. But right now, we have education system that practically do not solve problem, but just calm and poor. So okay. we need why you blame the system? Hold your thoughts there, Kuthi. You know, um, ASU is being threatened to be is it deregistered or so? Do you think that's a better way of the government responding? You know, there is this issue that okay, ASU go back to classroom because the industrial yeah. court said they should, and they said no until they've appealed and until our conditions are met and the rest. And the government is threatening to deregister them. In fact, there is allegation of registering two other organizations. Kuti, if you are there, what's your thought on this? I'm sure you are following. I think up. that. The I, I think that the government's position is totally untenable. I think it's the height of rascality. Um, I do agree that the strike has created some challenges, especially for students who have been at home for, I think, about seven months now. Uh, I think it's... I, I also went to university in, in Nigeria. Remember how painful it was for some of us who 
my husband had been at home for a few months. We decided to go away on holiday when it was looking like there was nothing happening. Then while we were on holiday, after two weeks, they said, ah, school is resuming, you have to come back home. We came back home, and then maybe a week or two later, we went back on strike. It's so frustrating. I didn't get a degree from Nigeria because after six years of studying in university, I, I was still not done, you know? So for me, I was just like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm going to be 100 years old and I'll still be in this unit. So, you know, I think that on a serious note that um, we need to look at, again, at the university system. I believe that many of us do not take the university system seriously. I mean, I, 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 mean, I have two children in university at the moment in the UK, and I know how serious, I mean, in fact, I went to drop some of them in school, in the universities, and I, and I saw the facilities, and I just started laughing, you know, that, you know, when we go to our own university, the university we went to, it's like a shanty town, really. It's disgraceful. So I think it's time for the universities to kind of, like, cut ties with government and run a proper institution the way that, you know, it's being done everywhere else in the world. University education should not be, you know, um, free. Never should be. It should be subsidized. It should be essentially that people that cannot afford it should have some sort of loans or grants. But I think that ASU is right. ASU does require more money to get the university system working. And if the government doesn't have the money, then ASU has to find a way to get the money. And I think the best way is for government to set ASU free, uh, to set the universities free, I beg your pardon, and let ASU, let the lecturers and the university find a way to get funds for themselves. Well, Kuti, that's a very, uh, you just shook the table, you know. It means a lot. And you, um, um, a little bit, you know, the issue of some government officials posting the, their children online that, oh, they've graduated and you see what is happening, the irony of sitting at home, students sitting at home and they are graduating from, um, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I think at, at this point, the government and everybody in power should be able to assess the situation and say, okay, we are at this uh, junction and we need to move ahead. I mean, sitting at home for seven months and st uh, still counting its embarrassing uh, for a nation like Nigeria, we call ourselves the giant of Africa. I mean, and the efforts of the government to uh, cut the powers of ASU by uh, setting up other uh, smaller associations is, I'm, I'm saying that's a short, a short cut for them to run away from the cause of the matter. The right. demands of ASU is very genuine and then mm -hmm. we need to only look at how this can be resolved so that the the children that are sitting at home for this seven months and still counting i mean can get uh, something to do with their life the situation in the society is hard enough for everyone and uh, for for someone to just be sitting at home idling away and then this election period where i mean idle hands can just be employed to, to foment troubles, and then it is not good for the society, not good for the economy, not good for the development of our nation. All right, I get your point there. So let's move on to the next topic. Uh, point there. Just, just before how you... can we, sorry, okay. uh, time, how can we be, how can we be perceived as a great nation, considering our style of politicking, this period of 2023 election, how do we focus on issue-based campaign? You know, you see a lot of banter from both sides, PDP, APC, Labour, and what have you. So let me start with Kuti. Kuti, what's your idea? You know what happened in uh, Britain, the, new, the newly elected prime minister and, and the process. So can you enlighten us? How do you, how can you, what can Nigeria learn from the process? Well, for me, I think that, uh, you know, um, unlike, unlike Britain, uh, Nigeria doesn't uh, practice a parliamentary system. So it's slightly different. And I think, but I think that there are lessons to be learned. For instance, the heavy discipline in the PDP today, and even in the APC, but I mean PDP most especially, where people are not respecting the wishes of the party and want to be above the party. In the UK, you don't have to be to lose an election to be removed as as leader of your party or prime minister. You essentially can be removed by members of your own party. And I think this you know, gives room for, you know, a high level of checks and balances. I think that, you know, the political parties in Nigeria are very disciplined. Now. The members of those parties are disciplined. Because every time people say, oh, PDP and APC are not good and all of that, I always laugh. I say, look, if you remove these people and put them in another party, they still will not be good. You have to look at the individual and also the institution. 
it's almost like people saying that Nigerians are lawless because people are driving on one-way streets. Some people are driving on one-way street. But the truth is that we're not lawless. It's because the laws are not being properly, uh, you know, kept. If, if, if there was uh, consequences for actions, I think more people will think carefully before they break down. I think this, that's the same with political parties. People need to, you know, be firm in those political parties and just make rules and make sure that anybody that, who doesn't abide by those rules is punished. Yeah, thank you very much. Olori, you want to impute something, our style of politicking. Okay, so, uh, so for me, I think um, what we have in Nigeria as of today is a politics of individual, not of a party. So when you look at, uh, take for example, United States of America, you have the Republic, they have an ideology, they have a mission, they have a thought, right? You have Democrats, they have an ideology. So you have to head out your own thinking of governors, have to go in line with their ideology or not, then you look at the one that best fits into you. But right here, we have people, individuals that are about just them. Right, so anything that doesn't work for them, and that is why you see the cost carpeting. It doesn't work for me, I move. So we don't have any political system. In the days, I, I take us a little bit pre-independence or early independence. We have the, the action group, we have the NCNC, we have the, the MPC, right? They have an ideology. What is the idea? Action group, AG, is to protect the interest of people of the West. NCNC is to protect the interest and the growth of people of the East. And the Cameroons. And the Cameroons. And we have the, the uh, MPC to protect the interest and growth. That is an ideology, right? But today we have PDP, we have APC, we have all those names party. What is the ideology, if I may ask you? It's just an individual thing. So I think uh, for, for us, we should, first of all, be looking at building an ideology-based institution, political party, then build a structure is a process. And if we don't begin the process to have a common goal, not an individual goal. Okay. You're uh, saying we should build be. institutions. Yeah. Exactly. So your thoughts on this, uh, our style of politicking? Yeah, I will be drawing my uh, contribution from where he stopped. And then in his line of thought, I think also what we have is uh, we have politicians here yeah, who only groups after each electionary cycle to see which party suits uh, their, their vision uh, to, to hold power, not because they have anything to offer. And that is why the focus basically is on individuals. You know, that is why, because you look at all of these parties, you don't know what they stand for. You cannot say, okay, if you go for this party, this is what they have as offerings for the populace. What we have is that, okay, this individual will come with his own manifesto and there's nobody that will hold him responsible. In the, even the party structure is so weak. So we need to do more in building these um, political parties to ensure that we are able to pick from the lot that we have and see the one that will make us, um, uh, make us better as a country. Oh, I love that. Okay, so what is the profile of a Nigerianized Nigeria? That is the national question. The profile of a deep tribalized Nigeria. Why I say this is I had from a friend said the Nigerianization ide ideology is an ideology. You're talking about political ideology now. So how can we be Nigerianized? If you understand me, I want to start with you, <laughs> Mr. Ali. <laughs> you know, when you go on the street, you hear people saying, oh, you're okay. Igbo, you're Yoruba, you're Aosa. Those things does not matter to the economy. When you go to the UN, they don't talk about Igbo, Aosa, Yoruba. They talk about Nigeria as a nation and as a country. So, <laughs> exactly, exactly. What, what the politicians have done so far is to ensure that uh, they make it look as if uh, it is an ethnic issue, this is a religious issue. Because in this present um, administration that we have in the country, we have a Muslim president, we have a Christian vice president, and we still complaining with, I mean, we have a barrage of issues that everyone is not happy about. Mm -hmm. So what has a Muslim president done for us? Is it, our, is our, 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 the issues that we have, is it about being a Christian or being a Muslim, being a Yoruba or being an ethnic? You know, the, the, we need to look at issues, uh, issue-based uh, campaign, ensure that what the individual is bringing on the table is what matters. It is not about the age. It is not about the religion. 
it is not definitely about the, the tribe. Thank you. Larry, what do you? Yeah, uh, thank you. I will want to say value, just like his line of thought. If you actually want to say we want to be a Nigerian and we want to drop the tribal sentiment, I'll look into technology, for example. It's happening already. Today, when you bought an Uber, uh, you call for Uber or Taxify. Do you ask if he's a thief or if he's a Yibo or Yoruba? <laughs> you, don't. you want value. You want him to take it from point A to point B. And at that point in time, you have gotten results. You've gotten value for your money. So if we can use technology, right, and have that same idea as an individual to say we want results, irrespective of who or how it's been done, right? You don't know if it is Steve or others religion, all those religions, but if we focus on results, this, we have an issue here. Road is not good. Who is best that can deliver this job at a considerable rate, mm -hmm. at an avoidable, uh, uh, at a time frame that will be useful to us? Let us give that person. All right. Answer. It's all about value. Thank you. To me. Kuti. Like, the term is American or, you know, uh, or they are to, you know, die for their country. It's because the country has given them something. What does it mean for me to be in Nigeria? As in, that is the question that the, the having Nigeria will be, will be asking themselves. And I think it is important that we should realize that countries that are largely patriotic is because those countries have something to offer their citizens. Like, you know, when you are young, uh, you were able to get a free education. When you were ill, you were able to get excellent health care, even, you know, at, at no cost, like we have in the UK. And then, you know, when you went to university, you know, you couldn't afford it for the system you know, was able to provide a means for you to attend that university, maybe on, on a grant or a loan, and you pay back when you start working. When you graduated, the system was again able to find you a way to get into a job. Now, you will be proud, proud of to be associated with that country because that country has actually given you something. So, you know, if the reason why people hold on to all the tribal sentiments is because that is the first, that's the easiest thing to do because... That's you know, there's a bit of a clannish kind of like sense in Nigeria. People believe that, oh, I will hang with my Yoruba people, I will hang with my Igbo people, I will hang with my fellow Hausa people, and then I will be protected. Then, and, and if you look at what the system throws up sometimes, it, it makes sense. Look at the government today. If you're a Hausa Fulani, then automatically it's likely you'll be in a, a PAMSEC or a DG of a ministry or a minister, or something important in Nigeria, because a house of planning person is in government. Those are the things that we have to, to throw out. I like when people say things like, that anybody, the son of nobody can become, the son of nobody can become anybody in Nigeria. And that is the Nigeria we should look forward to. And I think if we do that, and then remove all the, the issues of, you know, like even in our, our forms, they ask me, uh, where are you from? I was born and, and brought up in the UK, I lived in Lagos all my young life. Uh, I mean, where am I from? It's a big question. But you want me to tell you where my great-grandfather is from, what village, what local government, of what use is that? If we remove all those things, then people will tend to forget where they're from and focus on what they can do together. I think that, that would be my, my uh, approach. Thank you very much, Kuti. So thank you very much, my fellow advocates, for your inputs. Let's conclude by pondering on these words by... Mehmet Mura Idown, a Turkish writer and member of the Turkish pen, that is Poet, Essays and Novelist Center in Turkey. Show me a clever nation, then I would show you a clever government. This could be interpreted as our leaders reflect who we are. So, vote wisely, come 2023. Thank you. Baba Shola Kuti is next after the break.